Today, I'm going to show you how to play the brand new Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Adventures game from IDW Games. In this game, the Turtles and their allies take on the Foot Clan and other Turtles villains in scenario-based battles. There are two different standalone boxes for this game. There is Changes Constant and City Fall. We're going to take a look at the Changes Constant rules. The rules are the same. There's going to be different figures in here, but ultimately it uses the same components. So even if you just got the City Fall box, you will be able to learn how to play the game from this video. Let's get started. The game includes battle comics, which determine how each scenario is played out. Let's turn to the first tutorial battle, Something Stings. Here we have a little bit of background that gives us an idea for why this battle is taking place. We see special rules that alter the scenario. The strength section determines advantages or disadvantages heroes may have while establishing the amount of focus the villain has. The objective section shows what each team needs to accomplish in order to win. The victory section describes which mission is played with potential modifiers depending on who won. Here we see the setup for the first mission. We have map tiles, components, and figures that need to be gathered to set up the map. We will not set up the map now because there are a couple of sections, initiative, and decks that are used depending on which rule set you are playing with. These are a couple double-sided table references that provide a summary for how to play both rule sets. In competitive mode, one to four players control the heroes, and one player controls all the villain figures through playing cards from the villain deck. In cooperative mode, one to four players control the heroes, and the villain figures are controlled by an AI system using an initiative deck. Both modes are set up a little bit differently, so we will focus on learning the core mechanics of the game before starting setup and explaining the different rule sets. Each hero figure comes with a hero sheet. Let's look at Raphael's. Each hero sheet includes the faction name and logo with different attributes. We have Move, Attack, and Defend. His Skill attribute. Skill value determines the number of skill cards a hero can have for a battle. The Focus attribute. Focus determines the number of focus tokens a hero has at the start of a battle. Focus tokens are used to reroll dice rolls. A hero may never have more focus than their focus attribute. The Life attribute determines the number of life a hero starts with in a battle. Pizza tokens are used to track life. A whole pizza is worth 5 life, and a slice is 1 life. Like focus, a hero cannot receive more life than their life attribute. Below life is the awakening attribute, which determines how a hero can return to the battle after being knocked down. We will cover this more later. Each hero has a special character ability that alters how they are played. Every hero has their own unique set of dice. These are the separate faces for each die. Before every round, each hero will roll their action dice to determine the actions they may take on their turn. They may re-roll some or all of their dice once per round by using a focus token. Action dice are arranged in a row because action dice are shared. A hero may use the leftmost die of the player on their right and the rightmost die of the player on their left. Dice placeholder tokens are used to show what actions are available on a turn. With dice sharing, a hero may take up to five actions on their turn. After using any dice, manhole cover tokens are used to show that an action has been used. Skateboard icons are used to move hero figures. Katanas are used for melee attacks. Shurikens for ranged attacks. And shells for defense. The chi icon is a special wild icon. Anytime a hero rolls a chi icon, they heal one battle dice worth of health, 0, 1, or 2, depending on the amount of hits rolled. They regain one focus, and they change the chi icon to whichever die face they want. Each hero has special double icons on some of their dice faces. These double icons may not be split into separate actions. When a figure spends one or more move icons as an action, they receive the value of their move attribute as move points for each move icon spent. For each move point, a figure may move into an adjacent space, orthogonally or diagonally. If a figure ever stops moving to perform an action, their movement is interrupted and any remaining move points are lost. A character may not move into a space with another figure. When opposing figures are adjacent, a breakaway penalty increases the number of move points required to move. For each adjacent enemy figure, it costs one additional move point to move. Raphael wants to move into attack this thug gunner. Raphael spends two skateboards to receive six move points. Because he is adjacent to two thug brawlers, 
It costs him three move points to move here. He is still adjacent to this Thug Brawler, so it still costs him two move points to move here. Now he has no figures adjacent to him, so it only costs him one move point to move here. Now he is ready to strike. Battle dice are rolled when attacking or defending. Battle dice have six faces. Two blocks, three single hits, and one double hit. The attacking figure rolls for hits. The defending figure rolls for blocks, which can negate hits. Any unblocked hits are dealt to the defending figure as wounds. For melee strikes, a figure may spend one or more katana icons to attack adjacent enemies, orthogonally or diagonally. The number of battle dice rolled for the attack is determined by adding the attack attribute to the number of katana icons spent. Raphael has an attack attribute of 2, and he spends 2 katanas for this attack, so he will roll 4 battle dice. For ranged strikes, a figure may spend 1 or more shuriken icons to attack non-adjacent figures who are in line of sight. Optimal strike range for all units is 2 unless a special rule states otherwise. Range is calculated by counting the number of spaces to reach the space of the target. The number of battle dice rolled is similar to melee strikes. Take the figure's attack attribute and add it to the number of shurikens spent. The number of hits can be affected by range. The number of hits rolled is subtracted by the number of spaces past optimal strike range. Raphael is 5 spaces away from this thug gunner, giving him a range of 5. Raphael spends 3 shuriken icons to attack him, giving him 5 battle dice for the attack. Since his optimal strike range is 2, 3 hits will be subtracted from the roll. Raphael rolls 4 hits, so the thug gunner must block 1 hit to prevent receiving wounds. Defend icons are not used as an action, but they are passively used to defend against attacks. When attacked, a hero adds their defend attribute to the number of defense icons shown on their dice. If Raphael was attacked by this thug brawler, he would roll 4 defense dice, 3 for his defend attribute, and one for his defense icon. If a hero receives one or more wounds, they may choose to go on the defensive by changing one or more of their dice to defend icons and nothing else. If a hero does not have such die face, they use a dice placeholder token. They may only change their own action dice, not dice shared with them. This can change the dice placeholder token of another hero. If a hero ever reaches zero life, the figure is knocked down. When knocked down, any special move cards are returned to the hero's hand. They may not be attacked or attack other units. They no longer need to be broken away from, and other units may enter their space, but they may not end on their space. If all heroes are ever knocked down at the same time, it is considered a total party kill and the villain wins. When a knocked down unit is activated, they attempt to awaken. To awaken, dice are rolled to try to regain life points back to their awakening attribute. When a hero attempts to awaken, the number of dice rolled is determined by taking the defend attribute, adding the number of showing defense icons, adding 2 for the number of adjacent standing heroes, subtracting 3 for the number of adjacent standing villain leaders, and subtracting 1 for the adjacent standing villain minions. In competitive mode, a villain leader may be awakened with the values from adjacent figures being reversed. The number of hits rolled is the number of life regained. Focus may not be used to re-roll this roll. After the roll, if life is equal to or greater than the awakening attribute, the unit stands and continues their turn or activation as normal. If life is less than the awakening attribute, the figure receives a KO token on their character sheet. Their turn or activation ends and they may attempt to awaken on their next turn or activation. A figure may receive multiple KO tokens from failing to awaken and they are kept even if a figure stands up because some scenarios use KO tokens as a metric for victory. The skill attribute determines the number of special abilities a hero may have in their hand during a battle. A hero may only use one special ability per turn. The card remains face up next to the hero sheet until that hero takes their next turn. This shows that there is an active card that has been used. To use a special ability, heroes must spend the icons on the top left of the card. Bonus icons may be spent to boost the power. Leonardo uses Double Splash by spending two katana and a focus. He spends two additional katana to increase the number of battle dice rolled to seven for this attack. Now we will cover terrain, terrain lines, terrain moves, and terrain's effect on line of sight. Line of sight must be achieved for range strikes and some other special rules. Line of sight is achieved by drawing a straight line from the center of a figure's space 
to the center of another figure space without crossing any terrain that blocks line of sight. When covering terrain and terrain lines, if I do not specify that a terrain type does not block line of sight, then assume line of sight is not affected. An area surrounded by one color means that all spaces within that boundary is considered to be that type of terrain. If there is just a line, it is considered a terrain line and is only considered when moving or tracking line of sight across the line. Terrain may be printed on a board or be added to a board through tokens. Yellow is associated with slow terrain. It costs one additional move point to enter any space of slow terrain. It costs one additional move point to cross a slow line. Red areas are rough terrain. A figure entering rough terrain ends its move and forfeits any remaining move points. The figure may still start another move action by spending a move icon after being stopped on rough terrain. A figure may spend three move icons to use the leap terrain move. When they leap, they move up to three spaces in a straight line. This move is unaffected by slow or rough terrain, and they can pass over other units. Blue is associated with elevated terrain. Spaces of elevated terrain are non-adjacent to low terrain. When making range strikes, spaces of elevated terrain are considered to be two additional spaces away from low terrain. Figures in elevated terrain attacking figures in low terrain can ignore this two-space range penalty because they have high ground advantage. This thug gunner is on elevated terrain. Raphael is considered three spaces away while Donatello is one space away, and non-adjacent because he is on low terrain. If Donatello wanted to attack this thug gunner, he's considered three spaces away. For Raphael, he is five spaces away. Elevated terrain blocks line of sight if it is between units in low terrain. From low terrain to elevated terrain, and vice versa, line of sight is blocked if it crosses into another space of elevated terrain, going to or from another figure. If Raphael is in this position of elevated terrain, he has line of sight to these figures, and they have line of sight to him. He does not share line of sight to these figures because the line crosses other spaces of elevated terrain. Climb is a terrain move that can be used to move between low and elevated terrain by spending two skateboard icons. A figure may also move from high to low terrain by falling. When falling, a figure receives four battle dice as hits, which may be defended as normal. If a figure falls into a space of a dumpster, trash heap, or fire escape, they do not take fall damage. If a figure uses the leap terrain move from elevated terrain and does not end their leap in elevated terrain, they take falling damage. Fire escapes are slow terrain and are adjacent to low and elevated terrain. Blue lines are climbable lines which require using the climb action to cross. Climbable lines have no effect on line of sight. Orange terrain is unstable terrain. A figure may move through this terrain, but they may not end a move action on it. Orange dash lines like this one are grindable lines. A figure may use the grind terrain move on grindable lines by spending three move icons. When adjacent to a grindable line, a figure uses grind to move along the line following the arrows. Grinding figures may make an attack plus two melee strike against each enemy figure adjacent to the rail as they move. The figure must end their move in an empty space adjacent to the grindable line. Blocking terrain is surrounded by black lines. A figure may never enter blocking terrain. Line of sight is broken by blocking terrain. Blocking lines also block movement and line of sight. Pages 32 and 33 of the rulebook have great line of sight examples if you are still not clear on the rules. No pun intended. You have now learned all the essential rules to play the first battle, Something Stinks. If you want to learn other rules as you go, click the setup timestamp to skip ahead. All of the other sections are timestamped, so you can easily reference them for future battles. Green areas are covered terrain. When a figure is in covered terrain, they have plus one defend and are considered one additional space away when targeted by ranged strikes. When in or adjacent to covered terrain, a figure may use the take cover action by spending two move icons. Place the take cover token next to the figure. When in covered, the figure receives plus two defend, which can stack with the plus one defend from being inside the covered terrain. Gray is associated with obscuring terrain. Figures in obscuring terrain do not need to be broken away from and have no effect on awakening figures. Any strikes into or out of obscuring terrain cost double the action points. Any space with smoke or fire tokens are considered obscuring terrain. Line of sight may go into but not through obscuring terrain. Obscuring lines break line of sight. 
Notice, obscuring terrain and lines have no effect on movement. Figures with the machine attribute are not affected by obscuring terrain. Pink is associated with harmful terrain. Any space with a fire token is considered harmful terrain. If a figure enters harmful terrain, they suffer one wound. If they start a turn in harmful terrain and do not move to non-harmful terrain by the end of their turn, they suffer one wound. Focus checks are used in some scenarios to hack computers or unlock doors. To perform a focus check, a hero spends a non-shell action icon, then rolls battle dice for their focus attribute. If the number of hits is as high as the focus difficulty, they succeed. If not, they fail and can attempt the focus check again by spending another die. Doors are blocking terrain when closed. Doors may be opened by making a focus check or making a melee or range strike that exceeds the focus check difficulty by 3. When opened, it is no longer blocking terrain. Figures may spend two move icons to take the crouch action when adjacent to cars, dumpsters, or roadblocks. Place a crouch token next to the figure. Line of sight may not be drawn to a figure with the crouch token through these terrain types. Cameras are a special token used in some scenarios. Cameras have line of sight in a straight line in the direction they are facing. A camera does not have line of sight of the space it is in. When a hero enters the camera's line of sight, it is alerted, which has different effects depending on the battle. When a new round starts, flip the camera 90 degrees on the line matching battle setup. The camera is alerted for any hero standing in its new line of sight. Melee and range strikes may be used to destroy a camera. If a camera receives three or more hits, it is removed from the map. Small objects, such as manhole covers and trash cans, in the same space or adjacent to a figure may be thrown by using the throw small object terrain move. This functions the same as a ranged attack, except katana icons can be used instead. After the attack, the object is destroyed and removed from the map. Some figures can throw large throwing objects, such as cars, dumpsters, and benches. They are also destroyed after being thrown. Spawn tokens are placed on the map during setup to determine where villain minions spawn at the end of rounds. Spawning will be covered in the cooperative and competitive rules sections. Some units, like the Mega Mouser, have the giant attribute. Giant figures take up multiple spaces and block line of sight. For breakaway, they count as two figures. When knocked down, the spaces that a giant figure is knocked down in become slow terrain. Giant figures cannot perform terrain moves and are not affected by slow terrain. There are also tiny figures, such as Baxter Stockman's Mousers. Tiny figures cannot perform terrain moves. They have space sharing. Up to three tiny figures of the same minion type may share a space. When grouped, they attack and defend as a group. For Awakening and Breakaway, multiple tiny figures in one space are considered just one unit. Tiny figures may split up and do not have to move as a group. Figures can receive stun tokens from certain abilities. A figure must spend one non-shell action icon to remove any stun tokens before activating. A figure can have more than one stun token at a time. Some battles will feature non-playable characters that can be carried. A figure can pick up an adjacent carryable character by spending all of their remaining move points and move actions. It costs one extra move point per space while carrying a character and terrain moves may not be used. It costs nothing to drop a carried character in a figure's current space. In some battles, items may need to be carried to a specific location to complete an objective. A carryable item can be picked up from an adjacent space with no cost. This does interrupt a move action. Carried items may be handed off to ally figures by making a melee strike and rolling at least one hit plus one for each enemy figure adjacent to the figure handing off the item. Carried items can also be thrown to non-adjacent ally figures by making a range strike with hits equal to the spaces away plus the number of figures adjacent to the catching figure. Michelangelo wants to throw a gem to Raphael, who is five spaces away. Raphael has one thug gunner adjacent to him, so Michelangelo needs to roll six hits to successfully pass the item to Raphael. If the thrown item passes through the space of an enemy figure, battle dice are rolled equivalent to the move attribute of the figure. Any double hits intercept the item. Carried items may be dropped into an adjacent space at any time. If a handoff or throw fails, place the item in an empty space closest to the target. If more than one space is available, the opposing player chooses which space it is placed in.
Allies may sometimes be called upon as a reward for winning battles. When this happens, the heroes or villain looks at the cards and chooses one to receive benefits for the next battle. Let's set up the first tutorial mission in Adventure Comic 1. Place the map tiles 6A and 7A in the middle of the table like so. The players select the heroes they want to play. It is suggested to use the turtles for the first mission, so we will grab the hero sheet and action dice for each hero and place them around the map. Place the battle dice, KO tokens, manhole covers, life tokens, and dice placeholder tokens in easy reach of all players. Choose skill cards for each hero. For this battle, the heroes have a skill modifier of minus one, so they will be taking one less card than their skill attribute into this battle. For the first battle, I recommend these cards for the heroes. Make sure each hero has the appropriate number of focus and life tokens based on their focus and life attributes. Gather the components and villain figures and place them on the map tiles in their designated positions. If a scenario calls for more figures than are placed on the board, set them aside in the figure pool where they may spawn from later. Put the green base clips on each hero figure to make them easier to distinguish from enemies. Place them on the green starting spaces shown in the battle comic. Be sure to have the rules reference sheets nearby. We have most of the game set up, but setup takes place differently depending on if you're playing the competitive or cooperative modes. We're going to move on to the competitive setup and rules. If you are not interested in learning the competitive rules right now, I put a timestamp in the description below that will skip ahead to the cooperative setup and rules explanation. For competitive mode setup, the villain player receives the villain player board and villain sheets for all the figures in play for the scenario. Give each villain leader pizza tokens to track their life attribute. The villain leader receives the amount of focus listed in the battle description. Like heroes, the villain leader cannot have more focus than their starting amount. Finally, set up the villain deck by finding the colored ability cards for each figure specified in the battle comic. For this first scenario, we will use Alapex's red cards, the Thug Gunner's red cards, the Thug Brawler's red cards, and blue cards, and the Foot Ninja's blue cards and green cards. The regroup card is always added to the villain deck, totaling 25 cards. The villain player shuffles this deck and draws 5 cards. If the regroup card is in their hand, shuffle it back into the deck and draw a new card. A competitive mode round begins with the setup phase where hero players roll and arrange their action dice with dice placeholder tokens for shared dice. After this, we move on to the battle phase where the heroes start by choosing one hero to take their turn and spending all their action dice. After each turn, the villain player takes a turn by playing two cards to activate their figures. After each hero has been activated and the villain player has taken four turns, we move on to cleanup, where the villain regains one focus and minions are spawned. Then the round tracker is moved down and the next round begins with the setup phase. The villain player uses cards for their actions as opposed to the hero's dice. At the beginning of each villain turn, any cards in active zone 2 are moved into the discard pile. Active Zone 1 cards move to Active Zone 2, and the villain plays new cards into Active Zone 1 to activate their figures. Each card shows the type of figure it activates and the number of figures it activates. Each activated figure may use the action icons listed here. Spending Skateboard, Katana, and Shuriken icons from cards functions the same as the hero spending these icons from their dice. The villain player must finish one figure's actions before moving on to the next figure. Each figure may only be activated once per turn. The villain player could play the Destroy Them card twice in one turn to move an attack with their Foot Ninja, but they would have to have at least four Foot Ninja on the board to fully utilize both cards. Defense icons showing on the villain ability cards add to the defend attribute of that villain type. If the villain player had these four cards face up in active zone 1 and 2, Alapex would have a plus 2 bonus to defense, all Thug Brawlers would have plus 2, all Foot Ninja would have plus one, and Thug Gunners would not receive a bonus because they do not have a card with a defense icon. The villain player may use a Desperation activation if they need to activate a certain villain figure but do not have a card to do so. To do this, they play any card face down to activate the figure and give them only one move, melee, or ranged icon. A Desperation activation may also be used to attempt to awaken for villain leaders. At the end of the round, minions spawn for the villain. Of each minion type, half the figures in the figure pool rounded up spawn. Each spawned figure is placed on empty spaces in the spawn locations specified by the battle description. 
If there are not enough open spawn locations, the villain player chooses which figures spawn and which do not. Villain sheets for competitive mode are very similar to the hero sheets except they are missing a focus attribute. The villain player has one collective focus bank that can be used for the dice rolls of all of their figures. Each villain figure has a special ability. Let's look at the abilities for the figures you'll see in the first mission. Thug Gunners are eagle-eyed. Instead of the regular range of two, Thug Gunners' range strikes do not weaken for the first four spaces. Thug Brawlers are determined. They are not affected by slow or rough terrain. Foot Ninja are numerous. At the beginning of a villain turn, they may spend one focus to add two Foot Ninja to the figure pool and immediately spawn one of those new Foot Ninja. Alapex is agile. She does not lose remaining move points when she stops moving to perform another action and terrain moves cost move points instead of move icons. You are almost ready to play. We're moving on to cooperative setup and rules. If you want to skip this, click the timestamp below to jump ahead to final preparations. To finish setup for cooperative mode, gather the cooperative villain sheets and place them next to the board where all players can see them. They look similar to the competitive mode sheets, but they can easily be distinguished by the targeting priority symbol located here. Gather the initiative cards listed in the battle comic. Four for the heroes, two for thug brawlers, one for thug gunners, one for foot ninja, and one for alapex. Combine these cards to build the initiative deck. A cooperative mode round begins with the setup phase where hero players roll and arrange their action dice with dice placeholder tokens for shared dice. The initiative deck is shuffled before proceeding to the battle phase. In the battle phase, the top initiative card is drawn, activating the specified figures. Heroes take their turn by spending all their action dice when activated. Villain figures follow special AI rules. Keep drawing initiative cards and activating figures until the deck runs out. At this point, we will move on to the cleanup phase where minions are spawned and the round tracker is moved down before moving on to the next setup phase. When a villain initiative card is drawn, all figures of that type that have line of sight to a hero activate. When they activate, they may move toward and attack heroes. Villain figures are separated into two categories. Leader figures get three actions per activation. If they are KO'd, they are removed from the board and do not respawn. Minion figures get two actions per activation. If they are KO'd, they return to the figure pool and may respawn later. An activation for one figure must be completed before activating another figure. When activated, a villain figure checks if a hero is in line of sight. If any heroes are in optimal strike range of one of these villains, they attack. For melee figures, optimal strike range is any adjacent space. For ranged figures, optimal strike range is two spaces unless a special rule alters this range. If multiple heroes are in optimal strike range, Use the targeting priority located in the bottom right to determine the target hero. If there is still a tie, the players choose who is targeted. If the villain has line of sight to one or more heroes, but none are within optimal strike range, the villain figure moves toward a figure to get closer to being in optimal strike range. They may move as many spaces as their move attribute. Typically, they would stop moving as soon as they enter optimal strike range but they use up additional move points to move forward if stopping would prevent another figure from entering optimal strike range. Each villain figure may only move once. If they are not in optimal strike range after their move, then their activation ends. If a ranged figure only has line of sight to an adjacent figure, they would spend their first action to move away before attacking. AI figures may spend two actions to use the climb action to get closer to targets in line of sight. Climb is not considered a move action. When activating figures, start with figures that are already in optimal strike range, then move on to figures who are out of range, starting with figures closest to their target. AI figures do not have an attack or defend attribute. Instead, they have a hit and block attribute. When they attack a hero, dice are not rolled, and the hero must defend against a number of hits equal to the attacker's hit attribute. Alapex begins her turn in line of sight of Leonardo. Her move attribute is 4, but she only needs to spend 3 to reach him. She has 2 actions remaining. Although she cannot see Donatello before her turn, she is line of sight of him and is in optimal strike range of both heroes. Her attack priority is the hero with lowest life, and Donnie has less life than Leo, so she will attack Donnie. Since her hit attribute is 2, Donnie must block 2 hits to avoid any wounds. After this attack, Donnie would still be the lowest health hero, so she would use her third and final action attacking him. 
When heroes attack AI villains, defense dice are not rolled. They have a block attribute, meaning a certain number of hits are automatically blocked. Leonardo uses a melee strike on this foot ninja. He rolls 3 hit, but the ninja has a block attribute of 2, so he receives 1 wound. A pizza token is used to track that he has taken 1 wound. A flowchart has been made for AI activations to help determine how each AI figure's activation should be carried out. I will have a link in the description below that will take you to the files in the IDW Games Adventures Universal Game System Facebook group where you can find it. At the end of the round, minions are spawned. For each figure type, half the figures rounded up are spawned. All spawned figures are placed on empty spawning locations. Of the figures, one figure of each type must be placed before spawning a second figure of that type, and so on. Empty spawning locations closest to the heroes must be filled first. Let's look at the AI villain abilities for the first mission. Foot Ninja are numerous. If there are less than 4 Foot Ninja on the board when their initiative card is drawn, spawn up to 4 more Foot Ninja from the figure pool. Alapex is agile. She may perform 2 move actions per turn and ignores slow and elevated terrain while moving. Alapex may also evade attacks. After attack dice are rolled against her, roll 1 battle die. If the result is a block, the attack misses Alapex. Thug Brawlers are determined. They start with two initiative cards in the deck. Thug Gunners are eagle-eyed. They perform range strikes as a group. If multiple Thug Gunners would attack the same hero, instead of performing multiple single-hit attacks, they combine to form larger attacks. They also have an optimal strike range of 4. Let's say we drew the Thug Gunner initiative card for this scenario. This Thug Gunner does not have line of sight to any heroes. This Thug Gunner only has line of sight to Donatello. These two Thug Gunners have line of sight to both Donatello and Raphael. This Thug Gunner only has line of sight to Raphael. This Thug Gunner does not activate because he has no line of sight. This Thug Gunner attacks Donatello. These two Thug Gunners would prioritize Raphael because he has more health. This one attacks, but this one must move before attacking. This Thug Gunner attacks Raphael. Donatello must block one hit, and Raphael must block two. Donatello blocks the hit against him, but Raphael does not block any. Donatello now has more health, so this Thug Gunner attacks Donatello for his second attack. This Gunner has line of sight of both heroes, but he is not in optimal strike range of Donatello, so he attacks Raphael. Donatello receives two hits, and Raphael receives two hits. We are almost ready to play. Let's do some final preparations by reviewing our Hero Turtle's abilities. Raphael is enraged. When his life is 5 or below, he can reroll battle dice for attacking or defending without spending any focus. Donatello is smart. At the end of a round, he regains one focus or may give one of his focus to another hero. Leonardo has leader. After action dice are rolled, he may trade one dice between two heroes until the end of the round. Michelangelo has nimble. Once per round, he may move one space ignoring terrain effects and break away. Terrain moves also cost him one less terrain icon. If you ever cannot finish an adventure comic, use this victory bookmark to show which mission should be played next and turn it to the appropriate side, as a reminder of who won so that side can get a reward for winning. This has been my how to play video for the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Adventures game. IDW will be using this rule set in future IDW games titles and will be coined the IDW Adventures Universal Game System. It's going to be showing up in the Batman Animated Series Kickstarter that's showing up very soon. I'll be sure to include the link in the description below, so check that out. If you want to see more TMNT or board game content from me, please leave a like or subscribe to this video. If there's anything you're unclear about or you have any questions about the rules or future rules, definitely leave a comment and let me know. I'll try to get back to you as soon as I can. Otherwise, you're ready to play the game, so cowabunga dudes.